I have to do this fast. I was told to not uh, say everything that someone wrote for me. Uh, I have to say my name is Edgardo or Edgardo uh, Sternberg, uh, Eddie Sternberg, Masters of Science, class of 1987, and I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Simon Johnson. Uh, Simon Johnson is uh, the Ronald Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at uh, MIT Sloan and also the head of the Global Economics and Management Group. Uh, a member of the Executive Personnel Committee and Chair of the Sloan Fellows MBA Program Committee. I I'm supposed to stop there, I think. So uh, <laughs> there's uh, many degrees behind it, an MIT degree, a, Man a University of Manchester and uh, uh, Oxford University degree. And more importantly to me, uh, he was the chief economist uh, at the IMF uh, during uh, 2007 and 2008 very conveniently left in August of 2008. Uh, for him and for ourselves, because I followed his blog all throughout uh, the crisis in 2008 and 2009. Without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Simon Johnson. Th th thanks very much. Uh, for the, those kind words of, of introduction. Uh, thanks for uh, being, here, being here today. Um, and, and you're quite right, Eddie. I was, I do have to admit, the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund from early 2007 until August 2008. But nothing I'm going to talk about today is my fault. I just want to get that out there. <laughs> Full transparency. So the, the topic is what next to the global economy. And this is MIT. And, and you're back here for an intense, in, intense day. And a couple, a couple of participants already told me, it better be good, Simon. Um, which, I, which I think is totally fine. It's my Saturday morning, too. So, so here's, three, here's, here's three numbers for you. And, I, and I'm shocked that you don't have pens. And anyway, but anyway. So here, here's three numbers. I'm going to talk about the global economy today. I'm going to talk about where we came from. And I'm, and I'm going to focus most of our attention uh, with a lot of Q&A around where we may be going tomorrow and in and, and, and the years ahead. But here's three numbers. It's MIT. We've got to have some numbers, right? Three numbers. And, and if you remember nothing else about the today, the week, you know, what, what happened at your Sloan alumni weekend? Well, there was a lot of drinking at the dinner on Friday night, and, and uh, Guy Johnson said something about, about numbers. Then here's the numbers. 3.5, 73, and 10.8. Actually, it's 10.75, but it's early on a Saturday. It was probably 10.8. <laughs> so what's 3.5? What's 3.5% 3, 3 is the latest IMF forecast for growth in 2017, they think it's going to go up to 3.7% in 2018. And, and this, is, this, is, this is good news, or portrayed as good news. It's a positive. The latest revision of forecast is, is ticking up, uh, at least in some uh, industrial countries. But actually, honestly, it, it's anemic. When I was the chief economist at, at the IMF, and I worked at the IMF for three and a half years in total uh, in the 2000s, we thought 4% was a minimum acceptable growth, 4.5 was good, and 4.7 was really what we were looking for. So we've marked all of us, without even maybe fully realizing it, have reduced our expectations considerably because we've been through a very difficult decade. So one thing we want to think about is, is that, is that the, as good as it gets going forward, or can we imagine some upside for some part of the global economy? And, and what is this global economy? Well, we'll use the term a lot today. We'll kick it around. But again, we're at MIT. Let's drill down at least a little bit into the numbers. 60% of the world economy measured using market exchange rates, so that's what you care about if you're selling goods around the world. 60% of that is in today's industrialized, relatively high-income countries. That's the United States, uh, that's the European Union, that's Japan, and that's other high-income places, Canada, Australia, and so on. That's 60% of the world. 40% of the world is in what, what's officially known as emerging markets in developing countries, of which a big chunk is in China, and I'll come back to that. Now, this is a shift, this is a substantial shift. You go back to the 1970s, it was more like 80% of the world economy was in the developed countries. So the emerging markets have definitely risen using this measure. But the measure that often gets more attention, is more dramatic, it's got to be used carefully, is the measure of world GDP using purchasing power parity. So this is an attempt to adjust for the fact that you all know very well, when you go to various other countries, it costs, some things cost much less than in the United States. So an iPhone probably costs about the same in many different places, plus or minus some taxes and some competitive pressures in the retail sector. But the price of getting the haircut, for example, is very different in Kendall Square or New York City compared with low-income places. So when we make that adjustment, 
which is informative about living standards and how much people can afford to buy around the world, that ratio, 60-40, 60% industrialized country, 40% emerging markets, is reversed. 60% of the world, in purchasing power parity terms, is in the emerging markets, 40% in the industrialized world, and, and China, by that measure, is the largest economy in the world already. So with all these discussions you hear about, when, when will China take over, could China become number one, and so on, fascinating discussions, but actually China is already number one on this measure of GDP, and it's challenging, you know, arguably, you can have that argument for a long time, it's challenging the United States uh, as the world's number one economy using market exchange rates. And there's good news in these numbers, good news for global growth, because the biggest driver of growth over the past half century has been convergence. Poorer countries becoming richer, figuring out how to adopt technology, how to organize themselves differently. Spain, for, anyone here from Spain? Spain, Spain. So Spain, Spain, Spain has had a fantastic experience uh, since the 1960s. Spain in the in early 1960s was about 20% of the US income level, per capita income. Now it's 60, 65%. Yes, I know you've had a bumpy time of late. We don't need to go on to too much detail. Um, but you, you, your income per capita, that, that, that change, that sustained change, that transformation of, state, of, of Spain is an amazing success. Yes? Agreed. China today is at about 20% of the US income per capita level. This is actually using the purchasing power parity numbers. Um, so if China, so China could, China's had a lot of growth. China's been a remarkable success. If China could, could do over the next 50 years what Spain has done, that that would be an enormous transformation both for China and a big impact on the global economy. If India, India uh, and China started out at, at, at um, roughly the same place in the early 1960s. Uh, who's here from, from India? From India. Okay. So the, 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 the amount of progress we've seen in India, which has been significant of late, has not been as much as, as we've seen in China. I think we can agree with a fair statement. If India can go over the next 20 years to where China is today, that will be an amazing and incredible transformation of India and would have massive profound impact on the global economy and on global growth because India is so large in terms of population. In India, as I think you know this, will without doubt be the largest country in the world by population at mid-century. And by the end of the century, that will still be true, probably by a long margin. Number two will either be China or, according to some estimates, it'll be Nigeria. Nigeria. Who's here from Nigeria? Yes, you can explain that to these guys afterwards, okay? <laughs> So, where are we today? It, it's anemic, the growth, no question, the headline growth. You know, could we have some positive growth surprises? Well, the European economy doesn't, it has actually done better than expected last year or so. It's not, you know, the, the prospects for positive surprises, they look rather limited. The last surprise from the UK this, this week is unlikely to be positive for growth. Japan's done better than expected of, of late, a little bit. Could they suddenly, transform themselves and, and, and raise the growth dramatically? Hard, yeah, given the long process of demographic decline forecast for Japan. Could the United States turn itself around under President Trump? Well, I'm gonna sneak out early and let you guys discuss that. When say, no, no way, no way I wanna get bogged down in that one at this point. So, but, but I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, that, that if you really wanted to boost growth in the United States, if you really wanted to raise the medium term growth rate, you know what you would need to do in the United States. Immigration from the second row, exactly. That's what changes, that's what really would move the needle, and that's not, increased immigration is absolutely not on the table. Whether or not we reduce it remains to be seen. Okay? So we'll just put that aside for one second. So growth is okay, but kind of weak. The potential for convergence is outstanding. Absolutely, just as good as it was in the early 1960s for transforming the world over the next 50, 80, 100 years. I understand that puts pressure on resources. I we'll, come, we'll come on to some of those, uh, some of those issues, and, and there are se sessions later today, including with Chris uh, Knittel on, on energy. You can talk about that with him. But, but I want to step back. So thinking about, you know, I'm dangling this possibility in front of you of, of more convergence and more growth, and more prosperity shared around the world. But, but we have to go back a little bit in history to think about whether or not this is, this is realistic. And we have to think about how we got here. And this is the number 73. 
So almost exactly 73 years ago, uh, at the Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, big hotel, there was a, a conference organized by the US and its allies to discuss how to organize the post-war, it, it was 1944, it wasn't, wasn't over, but they'd been planning on this. If you can believe it, they'd been planning on this since 1941. Kind of an interesting time to start planning on victory, but they had. So they, they called this conference, and you can go there. It's a, it's a nice hotel, it's been really nicely restored. You can stay in, in John Maynard Keynes' bedroom, the room that he had, and you can, you can take a bath in his bathtub. Okay, it's a little weird, but you can do that. And, and if you read the histories, there's lots of fascinating stories about the, the intelligence of, of, of Keynes and his anecdotes and, 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 and anecdotes about him and so on. But, but the outcome of that conference was, it, was not determined by the British at all. The British wanted a, and Keynes argued for a very different trading system, one that would uh, allow much more the continuance of the empires that, that Britain and France already had in place, or had had in place before the war. The Americans said no. The Americans said, we're not going to do that. We're going to have a much more open trading system with much more uh, rules that apply equally across countries that choose to participate. Ah, look, nothing's perfect. I'm not saying this is a fair, entirely fair system. but. In contrast to what the British wanted, it's, it's dramatically different. And that's what we got. And, and you know, there's a lot of discussion right now, obviously, in American politics about uh, you know, so-called America first. We need to put America first and so on and so forth. I, don't, I, I honestly don't understand that from a historical perspective. The 1944 Bretton Woods system, which we Americans built, and yes, I am an American. I just, another American with a funny accent is how you should think about me. <laughs> I, I worked long and hard to become an American. Okay, and I did really well on the citizenship test also, so don't push me on that. <laughs> Some of you didn't even know there was a test. So we Americans, why, now why do we do it? Why, why do we do that? Why do we build that system? Well, it, it, you know, the, the sort of narrow, short-term motivation was, let's set some export markets, let's sell some goods around the world, which we did in spectacular style. But the big, deeper motivation was, let's avoid having another Great Depression and another global war. Well, this is by far the most successful trading system the world has ever known, okay, by, by at least one order of magnitude across multiple dimensions. The system came under intense pressure at in in, in, in the end of the 1960s, and in 1971, Richard Nixon had to decide presidential courage. He had to decide his moment of decision between should he save the global trading system at the risk of jeopardizing his reelection. Well, of course he didn't. He abandoned gold. We broke the link between dollar and gold. <laughs> and and pe many people said, this is the end of the system, this is the end of civilization, this is the end of the dollar, whatever. Again, look at the historical record. Not true. The, the, the position of the United States, the, the use of the dollar around the world has only increased since then. A have other countries grown? Yes, of course they have. That's how the system was designed to operate, guys. It was designed to be a participatory system in which you could grow through trade and getting access to the American market was the motivating force and, and, and the driving opportunity for the world. Now, there was a slowdown in global trade in the 1980s, and there was a lot of um, discussion about protecting the US market. And, and those of you who've taken a course with me may remember that's actually how I start my course in the global economy, that moment in the mid-1980s. Very intense discussion and a lot of fear about American jobs in the future for Americans. You know, and, and that was an important discussion. It's a discussion to which we are returning today. But in the 1980s, the political process, with all its imperfections, that I believe me, I understand very well, ended up with a continuing this openness of the American economy and the global economy. And trade continued to increase, and, and more countries participated in the global economy subsequently. You can grow based on exporting commodities if you do it properly. Uh, Chile, are you in the room, Chile? All right, so Chile, is, has, that's certainly part of the Chilean development strategy. Uh, and there are other countries that manage this too. But I, th I think even Chile will, will, will tell you that manufactured exports, moving up the value chain, is an important part of your strategy. You can just nod. It's, fine, yeah, okay. <laughs> it, it's one of those friendly cold calling uh, sessions. So manufactured, but manufactured exports need markets. Where are you gonna, where, where, where are you going to be able to sell with, with low tariffs? Where are, the, are people going to refrain from applying non-tariff barriers? Where, where is the, the, playing, the playing field at least reasonably, reasonably level? 
That's the question of the past, that's the question of today. And the United States has been an anchor of that, of that system. All of this is called into question by, by the shift, recent shift in, in American politics. This, this, is, this is, I mean, it's early days, we don't want to rush to judgment. This is at least as profound, this is a more profound uh, threat to the system than in the 1970s. It's at least as profound as, as the threat was in the, 19, in the 1980s. And it's with good reason. There are many people, many Americans, many American voters who feel that they've lost out from the global trading system and the way that it operates. And, and you know, if we had more time, we could dig into that in more detail. I like very much the work of David Orta and his colleagues in the economics department here, which breaks it down, breaks down the job losses and what's happened to the middle class between a number of main drivers, including technology and trade and the decline of unions. And they put technology, automation, and the way that Automation worked from the 1980s, including the information technology that all of us use all the time. The impact of that on a lot of middle skill, middle class jobs has been negative. Those jobs have gone away. People who had those jobs have been reemployed, but at lower wages with less benefits, with less status in their communities and, and, and in, in their personal lives. On top of that, we had a big shock, additional shock from a surge of exports from China in the early 2000s particular episode. And then we had a financial crisis on top of that that had many causes, and we can spend a lot of time talking about it, but in terms of the, this discussion, reinforced exactly the same kind of job losses. So look, let's be honest. The, the global economy and the technology development that happens here and, and over here and, and, and in this country, this has benefited a significant number of people, including, I would guess, almost everyone in this room. In fact, almost everyone who's ever walked into a classroom at MIT I would suggest, has done well and is going to do even better. You, just, you need to be up on technology. You need to be able to work with it. You need to be able to handle, and particularly if we're talking about Sloan School, you need to be able to handle the, the intersection between technology and commercialization. And I think that's, that's why you came here. That's what you've done subsequently, almost without exception. But honestly, for a lot of other Americans, it's not been so positive. The middle class has really got squeezed. And I think that's a major issue. I think it's, it is not, personally, I don't think it's being addressed and going to be addressed in, in the next couple of years. I think it remains an absolutely open political and, and policy issue. And I, I have no problem with that. I think that's entirely appropriate. I think that's how democracy should work. We, we have to think about how to make our system more inclusive if we want to preserve its legitimacy and keep it functioning, including in terms of growth. Which leads me on to the future for which the number is 10.8. Anyone got any guesses what 10.8 is? Population. population, yeah, who said that? Yes, population, yes, population. That's the, one of the recent media and UN population forecasts for uh, the world population in, in 2100. 10.8 billion people. Now, if you talk to John Sturman, he'll give you very dramatically <laughs> different, scary. You think I'm scary? <laughs> Show me John Sturman. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's, let's leave, that, leave, leave those scenarios to him. But, Here's the number that strikes me when you look at those, you go away and look at those population forecasts. Here's what strikes me. The number of people living in today's industrialized countries, the countries I talked about at the beginning, the relatively high income countries, it's about 1.2, 1.3 billion people today. And in 2100, after plenty of demographic changes, declining population in Japan, decline in some parts of Europe, and increasing population in the US in, in these forecasts, the total population of, those, of, of that set of countries is going to be about 1.2, 1.3 billion people. So population has more, across that set of countries, has more or less stabilized if these forecasts are correct. And the main reason forecasts, forecasts like this are wrong, or have been wrong in the past, is that they don't always get it right when birth rates are high and birth rates fall dramatically. Now, you, can, you can have uh, mistakes on, on mortality rates as well, but the big error has been on birth rates. The big controversy with Nigeria's population forecast, the big controversy is they forecast birth rate coming down, do they have it coming down at the right speed? So 1.2, 1.3 billion people in the industrialized countries, almost everybody else, that all that additional population shows up not just in the other countries, it shows up in the lowest income countries around the world. So we have at least 3 billion more people total on the planet than now. And we have, you know, we, we have 2 billion, 1 to 2 billion people living in very poor conditions, depending on exactly how you define it. It's going to be a larger number in 2100. 
So that's one, 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 one I think, fact about the future that, that we need to focus on. We also need to think about technology. In that post-World War II moment, after 1944, when the global system was rebooted and, and, and restructured by the Americans, somewhat fortuitously, the wave of technology that was already under development and, and that we put a lot of money into through a big push on R&D in, in the United States, for example, um, the space program, many other federally supported initiatives. That wave of technology created jobs, and it created jobs, middle class jobs, it created jobs in manufacturing. I don't think anybody at the time you know, articulated that or, or anticipated that. I don't think that was a leading issue, but they got lucky, so that's great. The technology that developed since the 1980s has not done that. It's fundamentally different in terms of its impact on jobs. And, and you can see this in terms of what's happened within manufacturing, plants that have stayed in the US. You can see it in terms of what we've done within our global supply chains. Um, those middle class jobs have declined in the United States. And the technology and trade pieces absolutely fit together here. So what's next in terms of technology? What's developing and what's going to be the, the impact of that around the world? I don't know. And, and, and you can tell me. And I'll, and I'll stop in a couple of minutes and we'll, and we'll discuss exactly this and anything else you want to talk about. But, but here's, here's a, couple of, a couple of observations based on things that are happening on campus and, and what current students are working on and, and, and where we see a lot of conversations we have with companies who want to come here and, and they, they, we, we do projects with them, they, they hire our students. Um, two technologies that are pretty much, that are on my, are absolutely central to what I'm working on. One is blockchain technology. So this idea that we can decentralize a lot of things and, and that we can have a different way of organizing activities. And instead of running um, finance through banks, or supply chains through single large firms, we can disintermediate, we can have more genuinely peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Why would you want to do that? Well, if, you, if you're happy with the existing structure of intermediation, you, know, you don't want to do that. But there's some really good business opportunities here. There's some good ways to make things more efficient. There are ways to challenge monopolies. There are ways to probably run government services better. You could change financial inclusion. You could reduce the costs of being poor, which is a very big and, and, and difficult issue in this country and other places. So there's a very large agenda here. There's, yeah, there's lots of thorny technological issues. There's plenty of hype out there. I, I really don't believe the idea that we're completely eliminating all um, of our existing structures. I think you, you're going to have to trust people within these new forms of more decentralized interaction. But who you trust and with what is going to change. So the nature of trust shifts a lot. We have a, there's a digital currency initiative, which is uh, the technology pieces at the Media Lab, and, and, and I work on the, um, the Sloan side of it. We have a lot of students engaged. We have a, a lunch or, or a dinner every week, uh, pretty much during the semester. And if any of you are interested in coming and hanging out with us and brainstorming and looking at the projects and kicking it around, it, it is absolutely, completely open to you. Usually I, I say this to a group of 150 alumni and two people show up. But if you all want to come, we'll just get a bigger room, OK? <laughs> it's really interesting. It is, you know, to me, it's like the uh, emerging markets were in the 1990s. Something is changing. You don't know exactly where it's going to end up. But if you're interested and you want to follow it, you've got to get involved. You've got to follow the details. You've got to dig into it. And, and it's, it's very fun and easy to do that through connecting with us at Sloan. <coughs> so that's blockchain. The second, and, and I, does blockchain create or destroy middle class jobs? Well, it puts pressure on, on, the intermediator, on the intermediators, existing firms. It's going to create new jobs. Where are those new jobs going to be? That would be my question there. In which country? The second uh, set of technologies is, I think, probably bigger in its impact. And then potentially, you know, it, it can go either way and it, to a bigger degree. It either can be more dangerous for us in term, the terms I'm talking about, or it can actually have more positive impact. And that's artificial intelligence. So again, plenty of hype about AI. We, we just had a, a course um, this semester on um, the commercialization of artificial intelligence and robotics around the world. There were some really terrific people helping us uh, from across campus. And my, my, my takeaways 
in, in short version is, first of all, you know, the reports of all our jobs being replaced by machines immediately have been greatly exaggerated. So take a breath, relax, enjoy the weekend. Secondly, <laughs> on Monday, <laughs> Start to think hard about where exactly this is going in, in the space that you, that you care about. Because in terms of um, some of the capabilities of, of AI, including the pattern recognition, including being able to do some analytical tasks that we previously thought needed to be done only by highly trained experts, it's already clear that they're, they're really AI has made some remarkable inroads. And, and the rate of progress on some things like voice recognition, for example, is, is absolutely stunning. Uh, Tim Cook gave, gave, gave a great speech. I don't know if any of you saw it. A great speech uh, yesterday. Um, Nelson Repenning uh, was, was, was sitting next to me uh, during the speech. And, and his, his iPhone is broken, so I was trying to get him to go to Tim Cook and have him fixed uh, <laughs> while we're handing out the degrees. Um, but he wouldn't do it. And, 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 and the, 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 the question looming, the question behind that the entire fantastic story about Apple, of course, is that, is that, is that Tim Cook, really? <laughs> That was, that was pretty, that was voice recognition at its best. <laughs> we, we, we did a hackathon, current students did a hackathon with Amazon and Amazon's uh, Alexa ecosystem, right? That's, the, that's a, that, you should put that in the Wall Street Journal, I actually wrote about that uh, this week. Think about that contrast. Siri was a big splash when it came out, impact not so big. Alexa is really changing how people think about voice recognition and using smart assistants to do all kinds of, to do all kinds of things. Um, so artificial intelligence is, is going to be very, very big. It's going to profoundly affect many things. It, it's not, I think the, the word intelligence kind of freaks us all out. Uh, and should not, we, should, we should not exaggerate the extent to which this can actually, in any time in the foreseeable future, do what humans can do across the full range of, 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 of tasks that we handle. But some specific tasks that we previously thought were extremely complex and required a great deal of difficult specialized analysis, those absolutely can be done by various forms of AI. And in terms of middle class jobs, customer service. You know, next time you, next time you, you talk to somebody in customer service um, over the web, think, for you, think to yourself, yeah, how confident are you this is the person I'm interacting with? You know, they're not spelling things correctly. Their syntax is a little strange. Sound like most of the Americans I meet um, <laughs> at MIT. Uh, when you talk to them on the phone, you are a pretty confident as a person, but only because they haven't quite got natural language intonation right. But they're super close. So what happens to our middle class customer service jobs? A lot of them. They're, they're under pressure, too. So final thought, how should we respond to this? If this is the global picture, if this is how we got here, the political risks, I, I think, are manifest all, all, all around us, particularly in the United States right now, but not only in the United States. What, what should we do? What should be the policy approach to this? And, and you know, it's, it's also interesting, and I think very encouraging, that a lot, a lot of times at Sloan, it's the, um, it's the students who ask me that question. You know, we used to sometimes, sometimes have a segmentation between, oh, no, these are business strategy questions, these are public policy questions. I've always thought they were much more intertwined. And I, what I hear from all my audiences around Sloan and MIT now is exactly the same thing. So what, and if we don't come up with the, if we don't discuss this, and I'm not claiming that I've got a monopoly on the good ideas here, but if we don't discuss this, if we don't get into it, who will? Well, I think you know who will, and, and I would be less optimistic about, about, about the outcomes. So what I would say is don't retreat from technology. Don't try to prevent it from developing. Don't try to hide under the bed. That is not going to happen. Actually, what will happen there, and this is what could happen on clean energy, for example, is someone else will develop the technology. And that someone else who develops the technology will have the jobs developing the technology, then they'll have a good technology that they'll be selling around the world, and that's their jobs too. And they'll be selling it to us, because we'll need to buy it. So you end up using the technology, arguably, but someone else has got the good jobs. So I, I, think, the, I think what we should do is the exact opposite. I think we should do what Vannevar Bush said in 1945 to the President of the United States. Vannevar Bush was the head of the um, Office responsible for science and research in World War II, and they'd had a profound impact uh, on the war effort, in Bush's words, by applying existing science and technology. 
figuring out how to make that useful in the war effort. FDR asked the question in November 1944, so what do we do next? And Bush and, and the, the, the group of scientists who were advising the US government said, do a lot more of it and create new science and technology and use that to build the technologies of the future. A and that's what we did. Partly in that immediate post-war period, but a lot in the 1950s when the Cold War became a, a com competition to develop technology. And when Sputnik was launched and we figured out that the Russians were ahead of us in space, nothing concentrated the attention like that. Since the early 1980s, the federal government in the United States has spent 0.5% of GDP per annum, or to, to spending today is 0.5% of GDP lower than it was in the early 1980s. And if you go back to the 1960s, it's almost a percentage point of GDP. So let's go with the 0.5% number. That's $100 billion in today's money that we're not spending on R&D. Yes, the, the private sector spends on R&D, but the private sector R&D, as you know, is fundamentally different. It's not fundamental science. It's quite different in terms of what it does and what gets invented than what you get with general basic scientific work. So I think we've got to do more of it. I think we have to go back to that strategy. And, and I would insist that we think hard about how we get value for our federal dollars. And I love what's happened to Kendall Square over, over here. You know, when I, when I was a graduate student uh, here in the mid-1980s, I came when I was 10. Um, <laughs> the, only reason, the only reason you didn't get mugged in Kendall Square was nobody had any money in Kendall Square. The muggers were all in Central Square. It was nothing here at all, right? And now look at it. That's fantastic. It's amazing success. It's also really expensive real estate. I want value for my federal money. I want to develop R&D spread across the United States. I talked to a, a large multinational company that, that hires people, middle class type jobs, puts a lot of money into trading in the tech sector, and they've announced, you can look it up, you figure out who it is, but they've, they've announced hiring at least 2,000 people, maybe up to 10,000 people in central Indiana. And so we had the conversation, what are you looking for? Why are you going to Indiana? Well, it was about where the customers are, it was about where they can access real estate, and it was about talent that's available, and people we can train. And the flow from tertiary higher education, some big name, some brand, universe, brand name universities and some community colleges, that they can pull into their organization. And this is an organization that has a lot of churn. So you come in, you get trained, you work for them for a while, you go off and you do other things. I like that. Spread this R&D around the United States. Incur run a competition, for example. Encourage state and local governments to make proposals. How are they going to build various kinds of tech hubs? Have them compete among themselves. Get them to think ser seriously about uh, the regulatory uh, framework, about zoning, about creating pro-job places, both when you build the infrastructure and when you develop the science, when it becomes technology. And I want some upside for the federal government. Because, honestly, this, this system that we've had for a long time, that many countries have had, um, you know, it works okay in some places, it doesn't work well in the United States. The system is, you, you all, you, we get rich and we pay some federal income tax and that gets redistributed in some fashion. We never did a lot of redistribution, we're doing it less than ever before, and all the political pressures that I can see in Washington right now are to reduce the amount of redistribution. Here's my idea. Federal government gets some upside, and I'm open to ideas. You want to give us equity, you want to have a share in the appreciation of real estate that happens when we have these big pushes on technology, I'm, I'm fine with that. Anything, make us proposals. And when the, that money comes in, it goes back to all Americans as a national innovation dividend. That, that, somebody said to me, I, I, I pitched that to some people, alumni last night, and, and their reaction was, that's socialism, Simon. I said, actually, no, it's the Alaska Permanent Fund, yeah. Yeah. which as far as I know is run by, was a Republican idea run by Republicans. I love it. Oh, absolutely. Put, so get the government to take that leading role with the payoff directly to the people who are backing the federal government. What does the federal government have that no other level of government has in the United States? It has an incredible ability to borrow, which we don't use very well. But put that to productive use and have the, the taxpayers, or actually all uh, citizens and resident, legal residents of the United States, have them all share in the benefits of that. We didn't do that after, in the 1950s. It, the political support for this funding faded out because people felt it was too elitist and too abstract and they weren't getting enough value. You've got to change that calculation. I'm open to other ideas, and I've got 20 minutes to discuss them, and we can keep talking subsequently. Uh, you can come visit us in, in, in my classes, as I said, uh, if you want to dig into blockchain or AI, if you want to put other tech technologies on our agenda, if you want our students to dig into those projects, if you want us to help build things all across the world, we love to do that 
as a fundamental part of our courses, and I think you all had that experience when you were at MIT, we're going to do, I believe, a lot more of that kind of work in our, all our education programs going forward. So let, let me take some questions. Yes, sir. What is your thought? Oh, hold on, hold on. So there's a magic, there, there's this alumni magic uh, thing where she's, oh, I, yeah. I, what is your very nervous, but anyway. Okay. Right. Right. I don't know how they got legal, legal right. clearance on throwing my at it. Uh, what is your thought about health care as a percent of GDP crowding out and taking away from investment because it's going to health care and without solving health care, some of these things can't be solved? Yeah, so health care is a really interesting and, and difficult issue. And, and I, I mean, frankly, have some conflicts. Because on the one hand, we spend a lot, on, a lot more on, on our, as a percent of GDP on health than other countries do. We spend about 18%. The British spend about 8% for roughly the same health outcomes. We also, we, we, we spend about, eight, they spend 8% through, through a public system. We spend 8% in our public system, and then we spend another 10% privately. So at the same time, we've got some good middle class jobs in healthcare, right? And I think we want to, and, and we, we could do much better in terms of exporting healthcare related services to the world. So. Do I think that healthcare as a percent of GDP needs to be contained? Yes. Do I think it could eat the entire economy? Sure, in principle. I, I think we will come to a political solution before that, but unfortunately, we're, there's no question we're not, we're not there. We're not there yet. Um, do I think that a single payer system uh, with universal coverage would give us better, fairer outcomes? Yes, I do. Do I think it's politically feasible in the next generation? I don't, I don't see that on the, on the horizon. But you're right. The driver, the, the, what, will, what will force a political decision is eventually healthcare as a percent of GDP. Healthcare eats all other opportunities. Yep, that, 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 is a, that is a pressure, but it's not a pressure, I'm afraid, it's felt clearly enough in Washington yet. Somebody else at the back, yep. Simon, you talked about the world economy may change in the future. I'm surprised that you, you did not talk about the one belt, one road policy by the President Xi proposed, how would that impact the world in the future? Is that an economic policy or is that a political policy? What's your take on that? Would that work? For people who don't know, that's a policy proposed by the Chinese government, a uh, Chinese government, President Xi, one belt, one road, which will change the world uh, in the other part of the world. Uh, what do we believe? Yeah, so this is, this is, we're talking about the Chinese economic policy uh, and, and, and geopolitical strategy to build an inter, a, a different kind of world trading system to integrate more with China. And the question is, you know, is that a challenge to the existing system? Is it complementary to the existing system? Look, the, and, and, the, uh, and one, one central feature of this is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, which um, has many countries, has, has, has got capital from China, has got many other countries participating, including some G, from the G7, but not the United States and not Japan. So I, I met the um, gentleman who heads the AIIB recently, and I asked him, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, how do you define Asia? Oh, he said, oh, that's easy. We're all the way to, this, all the, way to the Suez Canal. That's, it. that's a pretty big definition, right? <laughs> I said, what about Africa? Why are we leaving Africa? He said, oh, don't worry. I've got some other people handling that. So look, it, it, you've, been to, you've traveled. You've been to all kinds of countries. You know there are pressing needs for infrastructure, well-run infrastructure. Now, I'm not, you know, I think that the question around the AIB is exactly how it operates and does it have good commercial practices, what's the governance attached to projects and so on. Same questions we have about the World Bank, by the way, so it's nothing, we're not picking on anyone here. Um, if, if, if the AIB can provide sensible foundational infrastructure, funding for infrastructure in, in countries around the world, I say go for it, absolutely. That's what countries need. If the United States wants to continue with an existing role in the world, they should seriously consider raising the capital of the World Bank or pursuing some other route, but raising the capital of the World Bank would be a good way to do it. That issue is not being discussed in Washington right now, in part because people are very nervous about what Donald Trump will find out when he will do when he finds out there is a World Bank, which is, <laughs> which is, right, which is right next to his office. But anyway, try to keep it quiet, okay? No tweeting, don't tweet that one, please. We've got enough problems. So look, I, I think I, 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 am very, um, I am very open to the idea that there, there are ways to, to accommodate Chinese growth 
and, and Chinese role uh, without uh, overthrowing or, or, or undermining the existing global trading system. I think the Chinese want to participate actively in that, and I, and I welcome that. I think most of the problems that we have, and all the problems I think I focused on, are in the United States, right, with regard, and that was the, that's what has a big impact on our role in the world. Yes? There are some untraditional or unexpected changes happening in the, in the world, you know, Trump and all the policies he's going through, Brexit and all those uh, changes going against the current for that have been set up for the past 73 years. Which one of those do you think are causing permanent damage? And which ones can be reversed in three and a half years when the next elections are to you? <laughs> well, uh, the, the next congressional election is November 2018, so uh, you can focus on that one too. Um, it's a good question. So to what extent do we have a system that can be disrupted and, and damaged in the short term, and, and to, what, to what extent will it, um, will it persist and can you know, uh, various unfortunate steps be, be reversed? Uh, you know, there is no, there's no question there is a great deal of resilience um, in, in, um, in many of the, the institutions and rules that govern the global economy, and also in, in, in national security. I mean, you can, you can see that despite some of the rhetoric, you know, U.S. national security policy has not changed as dramatically as you might have expected, and that's because there are some fundamental interests at work there. And I think, you know, the more people like yourselves explain to everyone who will listen why it would be bad to put up barriers, to close off the U.S. economy from ideas, people, goods, services, I think that's, that's helpful. You know, I think that the bigger problem is not whatever policy, we know exactly how NAFTA gets renegotiated or broke or, or ripped up or whatever. The bigger problem is what I talked about in terms of the underlying decline of the middle class and anger that that motivates. And I, I think... And we're forecasting that educated we are forecasting that it's actually going to exasperate. When you wake up in four years' time, all these policies that are supposed to cure the problem are actually going to cure. All right, that was a very strong political statement. So thank you. Good thing you didn't hear it. We're all happy alumni today. Uh, but, but, let, let, so, but, but I think, but let me, let, me, let, me, let me just make it a little fuzzy in, in my answer so no one gets upset. Look, I, I, as, 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 I, as I've tried to say to you clearly, I think the, the problems of today have these deep roots in technology, the way technology is interacted with the global trading system, who's won and who's gained, particularly in the United States, to some degree in Europe, although I wouldn't put Brexit in the same, exactly the same box uh, as the rise of Donald Trump. And obviously the Europeans, including the French, the French just saved globalization. It's a little weird, but I'll take it, really. I know. Well done. Thank you. Uh, who, who would have guessed that one? Uh, <laughs> next up, they'll bail out Hollywood or something. I don't know. Um, so, 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 so I, I, do, I do think that the policies that are currently on the table, one form or another in Washington, will not help deal with these underlying problems. So they, they may exacerbate it. And, you know, it's American politics. It's, there's never an end. We keep at it again and again and again. And we have an election every two years for a reason, for a good reason, which is you get to express, you're, are you an American? Oh, you should, maybe you should consider becoming American. Um, <laughs> we Americans get to express our views, <laughs> and you better find some Americans to influence um, <laughs> through legal means. Uh, it, but, but seriously, I think that these are, uh, these, are, these are the issues of the day, and these are pressing issues, and these are issues we should all gain, engage with around the world. Who has the box? The box, the box is behind the pillar. Okay. Hello, Professor Johnson. Uh, yeah. Thank you for... Uh, Hold it a little closer and shout. Oh, it's a microphone. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it feels tough. It's not easy. Um, uh, I almost forgot my question. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for a very uh, engaging and interesting session delivered today. Um, my question is to do with uh, the advancements in technology and trade that you mentioned in your speech, uh, but in particular the blockchain technology. And uh, although theoretically its applications can be wide ranging, uh, the most uh, well known application is, of course, the Bitcoin. And uh, I wanted to ask you about your views on these uh, digital. 
cryptocurrencies. In particular, my question is about, uh, in terms of money being viewed as fulfilling three functions, uh, store of value, unit of account, and means of exchange. What, have you, what, are, on, what are your views um, on how Bitcoin could satisfy those? Uh, what are the strengths and the weaknesses? All right, so the question is about Bitcoin. And noth nothing I'm saying here today is advice to buy or sell securities or currencies. Let's just be <laughs> clear about that. Uh, you know, bit, bit, there's no question that Bitcoin does represent a, a, a fundamental challenge to the way monetary systems have operated, to the way banks have operated, um, and to a lot of the thinking about central banks. And, and we have been you know, a part of our project um, with, the, with the Media Lab is, is helping central banks think through what are their options now, what can they learn, what could they apply. Um, given that we begin to see a different type of technology working, including demonstrate at least as a proof of concept uh, by, by Bitcoin. So I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we should have an easier, lower transaction cost means of payment, one that we can use just like, okay, and we got a $20 bill, I usually have one with me, but uh, all right, I'm surprised they fall for this, but still, but anyway. Right. So, so you know, they actually don't have any money in the front row in case you were wondering who's going to pay for lunch. Here we go. All right, Eddie's, 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 on, Eddie's got me bailed out here with a 20. So look, this, this, is arguably the most impressive invention of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, yes, yes, the steam engine was pretty good and, 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 and electricity and so on, but, but this is amazing. This is just a little piece of paper uh, printed rather ornately with extremely strange images. Uh, and because it's America, whose picture do we put on the 20? Andrew Jackson. And what did Andrew Jackson hate more than anything else in the world? Bang. Paper money. So we put him on the 20. <laughs> um, so th th this is incredibly powerful, right? I can, I can make a payment, I can hand it to you for f final settlement. Um, you know exactly what it's worth. It's a purely a token that we carry with us. It has no intrinsic value whatsoever. It, there's a window at the Bank of England where you can take your old 20 pound notes in and they'll give you new 20 pound notes. That's it, <laughs> nothing else. They're not giving you gold or anything else. That's all they're giving you. So why can't we have a digital version of this? This, this is issued by the Federal Reserve. Why can't I get, why doesn't the Federal Reserve issue a digital token that we can use for small value payments, for example, that we could use to, uh, use to store the value that we get from the government in terms of when we cash our government checks, or we'll get my, national, my, my, uh, my innovation dividend. Um, it seems straightforward, but in fact, it's in, Eddie's looking a little nervous, I'll give it back to him. <laughs> It, it, in fact, it's, it's, not, it's not that easy for various reasons, and that's what we're working on, and that's what I think, you know, Bitcoin has put that on the agenda, and I think we should be very grateful. Bitcoin has a lot of other baggage and plenty of other controversies, uh, and I'm not at all saying that Bitcoin necessarily prevails in this, but there is a competition between technologies at fundamental level that is at least analogous to what we saw with the emergence of the Internet. The internet, emergence of the Internet obviously was a different way to structure, share um, information, and it's you know, if somebody told you in, in 1993, or I think it was, or maybe 1994, one of my friends did show me how the internet worked and did demonstrate the value of it to me. Unfortunately, the, the, the site that he chose to demonstrate uh, it with was a cat that gave personal advice. <laughs> so I did not immediately grasp the fundamental business value of that. <laughs> my bad. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I do think that the crypto, the, these cryptocurrencies and, and the use of these new tokens is absolutely worth your attention and thinking about potential impact both on you know, exactly what you do and on the kind of businesses that you might want to build or, or invest in. But it, it's also, you know, as I said, it's like emerging markets. You don't know it in their heyday or when things got really um, tumultuous after the end of uh, communism, for example. You don't know exactly what, what's going to prevail. And, and you have to plan accordingly. Who has the box? Who has the microphone? The microphone box, yes. Five minutes, yeah. <clears throat> um, not to belabor the political issues. This might be the last question. I think we've got five minute warning. Go ahead. Um, you had suggested that maybe the reason that the person that we have in the White House today is because of some underlying issues about the disenfranchisement of the constituents that put him there. Could you talk to us about what you think the drivers are in educating not only the disenfranchised here, but globally, and how does that, what are the drivers? How does the confluence and intersection of technology and bots and Siri and other other um, MOOCs. How does it how does it allow us and other economies to rise up and have a larger percentage of our population educated? I think it's a very good question. The question is about 
education in the future and how, do, how education addresses some of these issues of disempowerment and, well, they're not disenfranchised, by the way, they are voting, but they are disempowered, they, they feel that the system doesn't do anything for them. And, and partly that's about, I think, exactly education and, and about um, being able to work with technology and being able to be creative with technology. And this also relates very much to, to my interest uh, with regard to artificial intelligence, because thinking about what, what, kind of, what, can, what can an AI, what kind of jobs can AI machines do really well? Because I think I don't want to have that job. And what are they less good at? <coughs> Maybe that's what I should encourage my kids, my kids to do. Um, I think there's a big challenge for MIT here. I'll, I'll be honest. I think that we have done incredibly well here, physically, and, and intellectually, and, and we've helped develop the community around us to, a, to an impressive degree. And we could stop there. But that's not what Tim Cook suggested yesterday, and that's not what President Reif suggested yesterday, and I, I don't think that's what my colleagues and, and current and future students want to do. I think we want to share these ideas with, with the world, and I think we want to figure out exactly along the lines of your question, how do we use technology to change education, starting as young as possible, so that people are more empowered by the technology, more able to work with it, more able to get the kinds of uh, lives that, that most of us have. It, it, it is really important to focus on the fact there is not a fixed amount of work to be done in the world. And either I do it or you do it or somebody else does it. No. When I, when I first arrived in the United States um, as a visitor in the summer of 1980, I was five. Um, <laughs> There were, coincidentally, 226 million people living in the United States. There are now, by coincidence, 326 million, according to the census. So 100 million extra people in the United States. Now, I'm not saying it's all been roses since then. That's what I was talking about. But our ability to, to generate jobs and opportunities, our ability to absorb immigrants, <laughs> my god, that, 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 is, that, that is without question the number one great strength of the United States. Now, it's related to science and technology, I would argue, in this post-war period. But we had a lot of immigration even before we were good, even before we led the world on science and technology. 10.8 billion people in 2100, they need what you and your children and your colleagues produce, sell, advise, offer. The market is unlimited. The potential for convergence is fantastic. And yes, you do need to talk to John Sturman and make sure you get the sustainability fixed, sorted out. OK, yes. If you see him, make sure you talk to him. Yeah, I get into trouble if I don't say that. Yes, but that's technology too, by the way. Clean energy. Ernie Moniz, the former um, Secretary of Energy uh, who, un until, until January, has got a fantastic initiative on sustainable energy focusing on creating jobs in communities. You should talk to Ernie about this. OK? I, I think. You know, I don't think this is just like a fun topic for classes or a good thing to have projects on. I think it's a fundamental responsibility of a top engineering school with a very good business school. Because again, if we don't take this on, if we don't try to do this, both directly and, and through networks like with, with, with you, who is going to do it? Either people who won't do it as well or, or it won't get done. Right? You know that. So with, with that, I, I, I have the best possible, we're running us on Sloan time, sorry, five minutes, 11.25. I, I, and I'll be quite transparent with you about why I'm walking out the door really quickly now. I am going to my daughter's soccer game. Uh, I, will, I will tell her you said that. Uh, but really, but stay in touch with us. Come talk to us about technology. Be involved in projects, technology, anything you want. Come hang out with us. Come have lunch and dinner during the semester. It is really absolutely open, genuine offer. Alumni, take us up on it already. We want to see more of you more often. Thank you so much.